So, first impression? I know. PhD, electrical engineering. It's going to be one of those dry, boring talks. No? Okay. You saw a person in a wheelchair up here and you went, oh, it's going to be one of those sob stories, turn inspirational stories about overcoming great obstacles and great barriers. No. <laughs> I want to talk to you today about innovation. And a very important part about innovation is getting a fresh perspective. And specifically today, I want to talk to you about a secret on how to get a new perspective. I had a real dramatic shift point in my life back when I was 17. It was back in 1975. And I don't recommend this for everyone, but I got in a car accident. My parents were moving from Calgary to the West Coast, and I was driving the family car. And after we'd been driving for quite a while, we got to the summit of Rogers Pass. I took a break there. I got out of the car, and I was running to the washroom. And I just finished a year of high school sports, and I was amazed at how powerful and fast I was running. But it was interesting because that was the last memory I had. I didn't know it then, but that was my last specific memory of being a physical, able-bodied person. A little while later, I was driving again in the afternoon. I fell asleep. The car ended up upside down in a ditch. And the next thing I remember, I was in an ambulance and the paramedics were poking my leg with a needle saying, can you feel that? Can you feel that? And I said, no, I don't feel anything. I knew that wasn't good. And it dawned on me that I was paralyzed in the legs. I was paralyzed in my trunk from here down. I couldn't move my fingers. I couldn't move my hands. I could barely move my arms. Yeah, I was a quadriplegic. So why did I tell that dramatic story? Because let me tell you, it sure changed my perspective on a lot of things. Before I was injured and I saw someone in a wheelchair, I thought, oh, there's someone that just has to sit down a lot. Well, let me tell you, did that ever get changed quickly? First thing I noticed, bowels and bladder. Actually, that's all I want to say about that one. <laughs> the next thing I, I noticed was I was getting up in a wheelchair because I had no leg muscle or trunk muscle, I had to learn how to sit in my chair without falling out. How many of you right now are thinking, how do I not fall out of my chair? Think about that for a second. That's a very different perspective, isn't it? When I started getting around in my wheelchair, I'd come across these do doors with rounded doorknobs. Really hard to open. I have to get two hands, and they're really frustrating. Then I come across these doors with heavy springs. They were really hard to open, too. But of course, the best of all is when I found these doors with rounded doorknobs and heavy springs. <laughs> I'd find them in all sorts of places, but I'd find them in washrooms. So there I'd be trying to get out, stuck, praying that someone was going to come in to let me out. Well, I wanted, I wanted to demonstrate some new perspectives, um, even to get a drink of water out of a bottle. It took a few different perspectives before I could do that without uh, getting water all over myself. Turns out I needed to get a few more perspectives on how to do that with also a microphone on my ear. Uh, but you know, I started learning a lot about these different perspectives. When I was going through the rehabilitation process, I ran into um, vocational counselors. And uh, they wanted to know what I wanted to do after my injury. And I said, well, I want to be an electrical engineer. And they looked back at me real serious-like and said, no, we think you should be a social worker. <laughs> I said, well, no, my older brother's an electrical engineer. He inspired me. I've always wanted to be an electrical engineer. And they looked back even more serious and they said, no, you need to be a social worker because we don't think you can do the physical aspects of the job of an electrical engineer. I said, well, that doesn't make sense. My brother, he's an electrical engineer, and I know he spends most of his time behind a desk working on a computer. I knew I could do that. <laughs> so there was something about that perspective that was way off. They weren't taking into account what I could contribute. Another thing that happened to me when I was in the rehabilitation environment is I saw the technology that was around in those days. It was back in 1975, 76, for people with disabilities. It really inspired me. 
I wanted to get involved in developing technology for people with disabilities. I now had my passion, along with what I, you know, coupled with my electrical engineering. So yeah, I got into electrical engineering, and it was going really well. But you know, I got frustrated near the end because I'd been looking and networking, trying to find opportunities to work on areas where I could get involved with innovations and technology for people with disabilities. But I couldn't find it anywhere. I was ready to give up on my dream. But you know, a guest lecturer came near the end of my undergrad. His name was Bill Cameron. And Bill was giving a guest lecture, and at the end of that lecture, he said, by the way, I'm working with this young man named Neil Squire. He has broken his neck very high. He's paralyzed from the very top of his neck down. And I'd like to get him using an Apple IIe computer. Anybody interested in helping, please come and see me. Well, man, I blasted down there after the end of that lecture and said, and introduced myself. And I said, Bill, I would love to work with you on that. So that summer, Bill, Neil, and I, and a few others, we worked on this concept where Neil would use his breath to do a sip and puff switch. He was able to do Morse code, which allowed him to fully use that computer. It was a fantastic summer. Bill also gave me an opportunity that summer to work on my first piece of technology for people with disabilities. It was a fiber optic tongue switch for people who could only use their tongue to make a switching action. But Bill saw this passion in me that I wanted to work on innovation and technology for people with disabilities. He became one of my real key mentors. He said, Gary, you need to go get your PhD so you can get your own funding so you can work on innovations for people with disabilities. So I did. I went back. I got my PhD. Now that brings me back to my vocational counselors. <laughs> Seems to me they told me I couldn't be an electrical engineer. <laughs> Seems ludicrous now, right? But that just shows you the perspective they have. And I think it's the perspective that a lot of employers and bosses have today. Because there's a lot of people with disabilities who aren't contributing in the workforce right now. But I saw a fresh perspective on this about three years ago. I met a guy named Mark Wafer. Mark owns six franchises of Tim Hortons in the greater Toronto area. And he said, Gary, I hire a lot of people with disabilities throughout my organization, all different types of disabilities. Gary said, I hired this paraplegic to run one of my drive throughs and one of my franchises. Before I knew it, I realized that was my best, most productive drive through Why? Because he was a paraplegic. Paraplegics get very good at economizing on their movement and efficiently placing things in their environment so they get to them quickly. Of course it was the best writing drive through we had. Mark went on, he said, Gary, I hired this baker. This baker happened to be deaf. Most productive baker I ever had, still has him. Why? Not distracted by unnecessary discussion or noises that aren't related to the job. Mark went on and said, you know, Gary, there's this great rub-off effect with all my staff. My retention rate has gone way up. Really important in anybody's business, but particularly in a business like Mark's. Absenteeism had fallen way off, way down. Employee engagement was way up. Innovation was up. Productivity was up. He said, Gary, I don't hire people with disabilities because it's the right thing to do or the charitable thing to do. I do it because it's great for business. And I'll tell you right now, he's killing his competition. So when I think of that, and I think about right now in Canada, the unemployment rate, when you include those people with disabilities who have um, given up trying to find work, is over 50% in Canada right now, which means there's over a million working age Canadians that aren't working. It just it doesn't make any sense to me. That's a lot of Canadians who aren't contributing to our workforce and a lot of really valuable perspective sitting there, wasted on the shelf. You know, people talk about this impending labor shortage. Well, I think if you shift your thinking a little bit, adapt your thinking, change your perspective, you'll see that there's no impending labor shortage. There's just a lot of people out there that haven't been tapped yet. But people with disabilities are a lot more than just great employees. They've inspired or been part of and. Uh, innovating some of the amazing technologies and things that have benefited us all. When I first started getting around in my wheelchair back in 1976, 
curb cuts were just becoming common, and that's those ramped down sections of a curb where you can roll down and then get back up on the other side. And mothers pushing strollers would come up to me and say, these are fantastic. I'm sure glad they're putting them in for you. And that was the first little hint I got that, you know, what's good for me might be good for others as well. There's a lot of examples like that. You know, when you're in a noisy bar or a noisy restaurant and the TV's going and you're trying to follow what's going and the words are conveniently displayed for you at the bottom so you can follow what's going on? No, not invented for a noisy environment. Of course, it's closed captioning for the deaf. You know, the typewriter, most, most of you know what a typewriter is, I think. Um, that was invented by an Italian because he had a blind lover and he wanted to be able to read legibly her love notes. So he invented the typewriter. Now that's love Italian style. <laughs> you know, the microphone, the telephone, many others were invented by Alexander Graham Bell during his passion to develop technology for the deaf. The key, the key card punch system was originally developed by a person with a learning disability to deal with the challenge of the growing numbers of people to count in the U.S. Census. That worked out real well. Managed to turn that into a company that some of you might know now as IBM. Um, it goes on. Uh, ARPANET, the forerunner to the internet, one of the key developers of that was deaf. And his wife, sorry, he was hard of hearing, and his wife was deaf. And he made sure that you could send text messages across at the beginning of email. Speech recognition, largely invented for people who have trouble entering text into a keyboard. The optical character recognition on a flatbed scanner, originally developed for the blind so they could scan text and then have it read aloud to them synthetically. It goes on and on. Vibrating pagers, vibrating phones, originally developed for the hard of hearing. You know, word pred prediction, you're all using it right now, texting out what a fantastic talk this is. <laughs> well, that word prediction was originally developed for people who were very, because of their disability, were very slow at entering text. So you can see that people with disabilities have either inspired or been part of developing some amazing innovations that have benefited many of us. But there's still, of course, a lot of innovation to go. Something that I got quite involved with and is still going on is brain-computer interface. That's when you measure a signal from the brain and use those signals to control devices like a computer or something else. Imagine how important that would be for someone with a very severe disability. But also think of pilots and surgeons if their hands are busy and they still need to control things. It, great, great other applications. There's lots of applications in the area of uh, gaming. But you know, when I got to work in that area, I brought a new perspective. And it seemed obvious to me, and, but it was a very important contribution that I made to the area of brain-computer brain interface. Now, brain-computer interface isn't quite ready yet. It still needs more innovation before it's ready to be used on a day-to-day -day basis. So some of you may want to jump in and, and do some of that innovation around brain-computer interface. But if you don't want to start there, I just want to bring you back to the perspectives you get with the simple things. I want to bring us back to those rounded doorknobs. Because I'm still running into those damn doors with rounded doorknobs and heavy spring. So maybe someone here can invent a door that would meet whatever building code it has to meet. It doesn't require one of those very expensive door openers. And it's just easy to use. I'll thank you. Parents carrying children will thank you. People with wet hands will thank you. <laughs> People with arthritis will thank you. It goes on and on. So I hope today I've been able to give you a new perspective on how to get a new perspective. And I actually gave you an idea. Because if you pursue it, who knows? An easy to open door might actually catch on. <laughs> you know, if you want more ideas, well, you know what you need now, right? A fresh perspective. How do you do that? Hire someone with a disability. If you're not sure how to do that, come and see me. I work for the Neil Squire Society. I'll hook you up. There's plenty out there. Thanks for listening.